It's now time to turn specifically to engineers and locate engineers and engineering in the context of this, this brief and overly crude historical and somewhat philosophical sketch. Our context includes the establishment and established identities for universities and government as very high status locations in, in uh, German society. They were sites for producing quality knowledge and for producing the rational bureaucracy that would realize the unfolding of reason and guarantee progress. This, these functions made them key reference points, key parts of the context for the emergent identities, identities of engineering. So always keep this in the background as we talk about the emergence of engineers and engineering. It is because this, these high status identities, the high status identities of universities and government actually depended upon the existence of other identities, lower status identities, which were associated with more practical activities, especially the traditional trades, which were run by guilds. Now, as, we're gonna, as we will see here, the positioning of engineers and, and engineering in relationship to these two sets of identities, which is to say the, the higher status collection, the lower status collection, structures a unique dual identity for engineers, which I alluded to at the outset with the example of the business card. What's going to emerge in the German context would not be a single dominant image for engineers and for engineering, and hence a single predominant pa pattern. Rather, what would involve would be two different dominant images. Images of two different types of people with two different types of knowledge. Let's get some help here from historians and sociologists who have, who have examined this exploration at length. In particular, Karl Heinz Mangold and Keyes Gibson. They are two important researchers who have examined the struggles of engineers to develop a distinctive identity in this German context. In tracing these struggles, the struggles of engineers, it's important to understand, first of all, that this, the very concept of engineering was not indigenous to Germany, but was borrowed from the outside. It was borrowed from Great Britain and especially from France. It's instructive, then, that the French word ingenieur was adopted to describe this emergent and a highly diverse collection of people. Okay, we take this word from outside because we have uh, a collection of people emerging in the space between the lower status folks and the higher status folks. Now this was possibly because of the high status that the engineers in, uh, enjoyed in the French context as, as, as and Germans understood this, that the French engineers were key contributors to French nationhood and the Germans had intimate contact with French engineers during the Napoleonic occupation. So maybe the Germans realized this, and, and maybe they wanted to emulate it. Early on, for example, some, some states actually restricted use of the term specifically to military engineers, because the French engineers lived, worked and acted in the context of the military, at least especially as experienced by the Germans. And as I said, possibly its use was reinforced during the Napoleonic occupation, which was at the beginning of the 19th century. Although German meanings for this word would vary significantly over the next two centuries, the label itself remained, standing as an assertion, or let's say as a, as a claim, that the people who would be marked by this label were making important contributions to the well-being of the whole. Given that we had universities, philosophers contributing to the well-being of the whole, the use of this label, the use of this term, served as a symbolic claim, a symbolic challenge, symbolic advocacy for engineers in precisely those terms. Now, what would come to count as engineering in this German context was noticeable as well by the positioning of engineers in relationship to the sciences. Engineering was inferior to the sciences early on. 
engineers. Engineering was associated in the first instance with practical, low-status work, the practical, low-status work that was carried out in the trades. These trades had long been controlled by guilds of artisans, the guilds w which, which created and they, and they reproduced routinely over time fairly stable categories among the various types of trades. Indeed, the guilds, by the, during the emergence of the Enlightenment, the, goods, the guilds came to be understood as conservative organizations that resisted innovation, resisted change. And <coughs> according to the new philosophers, the guilds were, were, were organizations that were associated with a traditional past and needed to somehow be transformed or changed. But their role, so their role would change dramatically as with the introduction of the Industrial Revolution in Germany during the mid-19th century that brought into the German context as it brought into other European contexts new pathways to wealth, new pathways to wealth through industry rather than through the traditional pathways of land ownership. And this introduced many new categories of workers transforming existing categories from, from the factory labor, labor to the businessman. Now, Mangold illustrates the, the complex positioning of engineers by quoting an advocate for engineers and a, a leading rail, uh, expert in railroad development from the 1850s by the name of Max Maria von Weber. Weber wrote at that time that engineers exist, quote, in the center, remember he's an advocate for engineers, saying that the, uh, the emergent category called engineers exist in the center between the professions of scientists, artists, businessmen, and artisans, relating to each of them, but distinct from all, in virtue of its own peculiar element, and regarded by other professions as an inconvenient newcomer. In other words, Weber here is an advocate for engineering, trying to make a case that, that they should have some sort of coherent identity in the mix, midst of this emergent set of new uh, categories of workers in political economic context. Advocates for engineers for a new, uh, for a new category called engineering followed one of two models. One model had its origin in Great Britain, and it involved a strategy for building an identity for engineers around the concept of the profession and around the trappings of professionalism. For example, the establishment of professional societies, professional journals for sharing of knowledge, annual meetings for professionals to get together and share knowledge, in other words, following this British model, perhaps a higher status image for engineers might emerge in the German context through a more rational collection, a more rational organization of lower status identities. So, a German professional society gets organized. The Association of German Engineers, or the VDI, was established in the middle of the 19th century, in 1856. Now, since the concept of the engineer and the, the, category, the categories of people to which this label referred was far from stabilized, stabilizing, the, the VDI membership was actually a, a very complex and, and somewhat motley crew early on. Those who joined, in the first instance, all male, were basically technological enthusiasts, which means they were men who were interested in technology, and they were committed to furthering technological development for the benefit of, of either Germany in particular or humanity in general. But they saw in technology the pathway. Anyone who joined the association, you paid your dues, you could call yourself an engineer. So some of these were technicians, but the, the, the VDI also included master carpenters. It included master masons. It included technical directors, uh, which, were which was an administrative role in technical projects. It included teachers, and it also included, importantly, early on, professors. But this professional, this approach, this British approach, 
was only partly successful in building an identity and a, and a status for engineers. The presence of professors here alerts us to a parallel effort to develop an elite image for engineers, one that would prove to be more appropriate for the German context than the professional model, and hence more effective at achieving visibility for engineers. Remember that the universities had high status. So it shouldn't be any surprise then that the key pathway for building an emergence for engineers in the German confederation would be higher education. Now, the main stated goal, the main goal for justifying developing uh, educational institutions for technical specialists was to find ways of stimulating economic growth. Remember that we're now in the 19th century. The Industrial Revolution is booming in Great Britain, and Great Britain's strength as a colonial nation is expanding by the day. The, also, the, the German states had just been occupied by the French. And the German uh, were well aware of these, the, the growing strength of other countries in the, in, in the European continent. For a model, the advocates for engineering turned initially to the French Ecole Polytechnique, which was the top French engineering and indeed academic institution in the country, which had been established in, in the 1790s, 1794. German advocates for engineers established in the 1820s and the 1830s what would become known as Technische Hochschulen, which the sociologist Kies Gispen translates as Higher Technical Institutes. And I'll use this translated term. To the leaders of the, of the German states, the Higher Technical Institutes indeed offered the promise of stimulating economic growth and participating in the new industries and hence successfully com competing both internally and externally, but did so without upsetting the established hierarchy that had located universities and government bureaucracy at the top of the social scale. So if you establish new institutions rather than transforming the old ones, we can preserve those elite statuses. So it was important to keep the higher technical institutes separate from the universities in this German context. And as the German historian Wolfhard Weber put it in explaining why, why Prussian universities wouldn't include the polytechnic content, the engineering content in the fr uh, from the French Ecole Polytechnique, said, and I quote, the project was politically suspect from the viewpoint of the Prussian king and some of the aristocracy, with good reason. Polytechnic training, with its origin in the French Revolution, was certainly bourgeois and emancipatory in nature. It's important to understand that the Ecole Polytechnique was established during the French Revolution to serve as the, the most elite uh, institution and provide some oversight over other engineering schools that had been established during the old regime. In addition, the universities viewed these, these emergent institutions, the emergent institutes, as an extension of materialism. I remember that emergence of reason here. And, and to extend materialism in an academic set, setting threatened the free pursuit of pure knowledge. We needed the free pursuit of pure knowledge in order to successfully achieve the unfolding of reason. As Mangold, Mangold um, put it, quote, the place of technology, or in the German context, technics, had to remain outside of the university. The university was hostile to economic affairs, or at least to technology and industry. How, however, despite the fact that these new higher technical institutes were located in a status subordinate to the universities, the faculty became activists. The faculty in these institutes actively thought a sought a status that was equal to the university. Their strategy involved adapting the French emphasis on theory, but in a very, with, with some very important differences. Remember that these German engineering faculty are working in a, a context in which practical knowledge uh, was already established 
although established in a subordinate position. They were not able to replicate the distinctive French approach which involved to engineering knowledge, which involved basing everything first in higher mathematics and then treating each area of engineering application as simply an applied science to be derived theoretically from the pure mathematics which lived at the core. Instead, the German engineering faculty were working to demonstrate that the, that the empirical dimensions, the hands-on dimensions of the useful arts, as opposed, remember, to the fine arts, we're interested here in practical knowledge and the useful arts, the trades, formerly the trades, these empirical dimensions shared something common. They shared a common basis in method. So the engineering faculty in the German context found themselves working up from practical knowledge, working up from practical activities, especially early on in mining, um, rather than down from pure mathematical theory as the French did. Now, it's important that these higher technical institutes were distinct from, from other lower status technical institutions that had already been in place, which pr were providing simply, um, let's say, basic hands-on education in empirical practice. Not simply, but significantly, and, as we'll see. And uh, hands-on education in, in empirical practice, such as oh, milling or tool work and, and, and so on. These latter, um, schools which provided education for artisans had long been dismissed during the 19th century as, and this was the, the, uh, the term often used for them in public, plumber's academies. The faculty at the higher technical institutes were seeing themselves in the same way that the faculty at the professors at the university, seeing themselves as contributing to the emergence of reason. So they, were well, they worked to develop a new form of knowledge, something that would eventually, uh, or that would emerge as a precursor of many of today's engineering science. As Mangold puts it, quote, the task then for the faculty was to reach an autonomous area of scientific technology. Now note this term, scientific technology. Technology is the noun here. Scientific is the adjective modifying the term. Important concept because the sciences have a, an established position in the universities. Scientific technology in which it should become possible to reconcile scientific theory and the empirical practice of the trades. That is, in the conviction that the technical science was not the same as applied science, which was the, German Im uh, the French image applied science derived from the pure mathematics, in opposition to the, to the views of the École Polytechnique in Paris. Thus, a kind of academizing program, academizing program means uh, um, bringing this activity into a, a greater uh, legitimacy in the academic setting of Germany, and an emancipatory goal, emancipatory meaning that is calling attention to value in lower status knowledge, practical knowledge, were clearly formulated together." End quote. So to say that they're pursuing this emancipatory goal um, in involved calling attention to this lower status work that had formerly been associated just with the guilds and with the trades. These now, from the point of view of the, of the, of the German engineering uh, thinkers, could provide sites for the emergence or the unfolding of reason, the demonstration of progress. So, in principle, what this meant was that lower class people serving in these occupations might also be vehicles, might also be sites for German progress. Now, but as we're going to see here, to gain legitimacy for such a revised identity of, the, of uh, lower status practical work wouldn't be so easy. 